we've just heard that the British government doesn't intend to publish an economic analysis of its deal with the European Union struck at the end of last year. I think we can guess why it's so reluctant to do so. Um, Brexit is not going well economically, and the problems of it are daily becoming more apparent. I think particularly serious are the problems for the City of London, a crucial part of the British economy. Uh, at the beginning of the year, the City of London had the unpleasant experience of seeing that Amsterdam had overtaken it uh, as the leading uh, market uh, for European equities. And we've just found out that the carbon emission trading market, uh, which has something like a, a billion euros worth of contracts every day, is going to, to the Netherlands as well. It's been estimated that 7,500 city jobs have been lost and have been relocated to continental Europe. In his recent speech, the governor of the Bank of England, uh, Andrew Bailey, uh, warned the European Union against unrealistic expectations of the City of London and of the British government. Um, that was um, widely hailed in the Eurosceptic press, um, but for my, for my money, uh, it was a, a sign of the growing concern in the City of London and people like the Governor of the Bank of England that the negotiations with the European Union this year on equivalents and making it easier for British firms to offer their services in continental Europe are not going to be easy at all. There are lots of people in the European Union who think that Brexit is an opportunity to repatriate um, and to consolidate um, financial services in the European Union um, and they're not convinced um, by the argument um, that the city is a uniquely favourable and efficient market uh, for all financial services. Uh, that would be a very bad outcome for the British government, 10% of whose um, revenue uh, comes from the city. If that were infringed, then it would be much more difficult for the British government to pursue its much touted policy uh, of levelling up. We might find ourselves uh, levelling down. Uh, it was widely commented at the time of the trade and cooperation agreement um, that there was very little in it about financial services, uh, which is why the negotiations are, are carrying on. On the contrary, by contrast, um, there was a lot about the fishing industry. And ironically, in spite of all these pages devoted to the fishing industry, um, the fishermen of the United Kingdom find themselves in the same uncertain position um, as those who work in financial services. Uh, it's true uh, that over the coming five years, uh, there will be an increase in British quota, uh, fish that can, can be caught um, in the traditional annual quota allocation. Um, but that's made more difficult and made more less attractive by the difficulties which now arise about exporting this fish that the British fishermen catch. That's particularly true of Scottish fishermen, um, who were some of the most um, enthusiastic advocates of Brexit in 2016. They're finding considerable difficulty exporting their, their produce, uh, their catch to continental Europe, and they've certainly not been reassured um, by the flippant and frivolous remarks of, um, of J Jacob Rees-Mogg um, about um, British fish feeling happier swimming in British waters. Um, the SNP have certainly noted that thoughtless remark. Uh, but if difficulty has uh, arisen for the British fishermen, um, existential problems have arisen, arisen for shellfish producers. Um, almost inadvertently, the British government seems to have eliminated um, market uh, for British shellfish, particularly those which come from the southwest and, uh, of England uh, um, and Wales. Um, this isn't something that um, is an easy subject. Um, there's a, a, a lively controversy between the British government and the Commission uh, about who's responsible for it. Um, but at the end of the day, we do know um, that there is not going to be an easy solution uh, and the British government may well find itself confronted uh, with an end to the shellfish industry and there's nothing they can do about it. Agriculture, of course, will be similarly affected uh, and that will get worse as, as the year wears on. Um, because the, the um, sanitary uh, and customs formalities are, are going to be much more demanding in the coming months. Um, they've been phased in over the first six months. By the end of June, um, it will be much more difficult, for instance, for land exporters um, to sell their goods in France, which has always been a, a very good market for, for Welsh land. 
but it's not just the traditional industries of agriculture, marine, uh, fisheries, uh, and finance that's being affected. Um, a very good example of problems of Brexit um, is the um, European Chemicals Database. For sovereignty related reasons, the British government refused to allow the British um, chemical industry to be associated with this database. And they're going to have to recreate a, a, new, a new database. Um, the British chemical industry paid some 500 million pounds in order to set up a, and run this database. Now it will cost a billion to set up a new database. It's a very good example, this um, the chemical database, uh, of the way in which we spend a great deal of, of money and effort to reproduce at best um, the advantages that we already had under Brexit, uh, before Brexit. Um, there are a number of other individuals and uh, companies and sectors um, that are being adversely affected by Brexit. We seem to read about a new one every day. Um, uh, fashion producers, fashion models, racing car, car owners, um, and above all, musicians um, will find it more difficult um, to pursue multi-country multi um, tours. Um, the uh, ironic situation of the music industry is, is illustrated by the fact that a, a very prominent rock star um, told us in, in no uncertain and indeed obscene terms in 2019 that Brexit wouldn't affect his industry at all. Well, that turned out to be entirely wrong. There are also difficulties for consumers, people ordering online from continental Europe. They find themselves um, having to pay in customs and other duties, other expenses, um, twice the price of what their original order was. Uh, that's a, a court form of protectionism, of course, and like all protectionism, it's at the expense um, of, the, of, 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 the, um, uh, of the consumer. We don't know exactly what's going to happen over the coming months, um, but we do know that uh, in January of this year, exports to the European Union were down 68%. Now, some of that, of course, was to do with COVID, um, but it can't by any means, all of it or even most of it have been to do with COVID. Uh, the government um, prides itself on having avoided excessive queues in, in Kent, um, and that's um, to their credit to a limited extent. But the reason why the queues have been avoided is because economic activity has been reduced. And economic activity is reduced by the definition under the new formalities of Brexit. Uh, we're told that um, by the time all these new formalities come properly into being, at the halfway through the year, we will need 50,000 extra customs and other officials. We've nothing like that at the moment. Um, and the, this government, above all governments, um, will be very happy to decry the need for 50,000 new bureaucrats, as it would put it. Um, but when it's a question of making Brexit happen, um, then 50,000 bureaucrats um, are something they're very, very willing to endorse. I think before finishing this, I should say a word about Northern Ireland, um, which is a particular victim uh, of the way Brexit has, has panned out. Uh, Northern Ireland is a part of the United Kingdom uh, where we have had shortages in shops and we've even had alleged threats against the officials who are carrying out Brexit um, uh, checks um, at Larne in Northern Ireland. And this has led the British government to ask for substantial revisions and um, extra transition periods within the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, something the European Union has been very reluctant to endorse because there's a feeling in the European Union and a feeling in this country as well, that the British government was never um, sincere and acting in good faith in signing the Northern Ireland Protocol um, and indeed um, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement insofar as it related to, to Northern Ireland. That suspicion is enhanced and reinforced by the way in which the Article 16 controversy of a couple of weeks ago played out. You'll remember that the European Union uh, considered and planned at one stage to invoke Article 16 in, in the context of COVID-19 vaccines. Um, that article uh, being an article which allows certain elements of the Northern Ireland Protocol to be suspended. Now that was a mistake which the European Commission immediately rectified after the protests of the Irish government. But the British government has taken this as, as an opportunity um, to claim that further reaching reforms of the protocol are necessary. Uh, this sits ill in the mouth of the British government 
because itself it has frequently pr threatened to use Article 16 if it didn't get its way and for it to be using this temporary mistake of the European Commission uh, as an opportunistic um, opening um, to demand fundamental changes in the, in the protocol um, is uh, more than um, a provocation. It's something that the European Union is very reluctant to allow itself to, to accept. There have been snappy exchanges between the European Union um, and Mr. Gove, um, and negotiations continue. We've had over the past few months, or past couple of weeks even, um, uh, a heating up of the tone of the exchanges between the European Union and the United Kingdom. This started with the petty and, in my view, vindictive decision of the United Kingdom not to allow ambassadorial status to the representative of the U European Union um, in the United Kingdom. Uh, I think um, that there is a, a real danger that the next controversy in the, this, these exchanges will be the question of the extension um, of the provisional application uh, of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Uh, at the moment, um, the provisional application only extends until the end of February. And the European Union uh, say that they need a longer time in order to give the European Parliament um, an opportunity, a proper opportunity of, of considering the deal um, and endorsing it as constitutionally it's entitled to do. It looks as if the British government may well be trying to drag its feet on this um, extension. Uh, and if so, it perhaps has at the back of its mind the idea that somehow it can exert pressure on the European Union um, by bringing it to the precipice of what would effectively be a no deal. Because without the uh, endorsement of the European Parliament, there can be no deal. Uh, if that happens, I, I think that it will be um, a reflection of a certain view which I detect in the British government, um, that it can dis distract attention from the problems of Brexit by culture wars against the European Union and the European Commission, presenting it as being uh, unreasonable, uh, intransigent, uh, uh, and dishonorable. Um, it may even be um, that there are certain people in the British government who think that a sort of Cold War existing between the European Union and the United Kingdom would be advantageous to the Conservative Party. There are certainly elements of the conservative press and perhaps even conservative voters who, who would welcome that. But I think it would be a mistake because I don't think Britain is well placed, the United Kingdom is well placed to conduct such a Cold War with the European Union. I think such a Cold War with the European Union would be at worst a chilly weekend for the European Union, but for the United Kingdom it would be a long and bitter Siberian winter. <laughs>